Hi there, I'm Tarek Basley and this is Downstream with some of the week's top science and technology stories on Al Jazeera. This week, round the world on solar power. We hear from the pilots who will take the controls of solar impulse. The 15 minute lab test for Ebola that fits inside a suitcase are sites that stream movies breaking copyright law. And we meet the father of Roboy, a new and intelligent breed of robot. It has a wingspan of 72 metres, more than a jumbo jet, and weighs just over two tonnes, the same as a car. The solar-powered plane Solar Impulse is undergoing final checks in Abu Dhabi before it takes off on its first leg of a historic round-the-world flight. It has 17,000 solar cells built into its wings. During daylight, they power four electric motors and recharge large lithium batteries. Come night, and these batteries maintain power to the motors. It's an energy-efficient system that means the aircraft never runs out of fuel. Their round-the-world route will take them from the Middle East to India, China, across the Pacific Ocean to Hawaii, and then across the US, the Atlantic, to Southern Europe before arriving back in Abu Dhabi. You have uh, an equipment in the cockpit that allows the pilot alone to fly for five days, five nights, maybe even more. You have the toilets, you have food, you have water, you can uh, recline the seats to, to rest, little periods of 20 minutes at a time. Uh, but I, I think more than that, uh, I've initiated this project 13 years ago. It's a passion. And as much for my colleague André Borchberg as for me, because we're going to take turns in the cockpit, I think the passion will keep us awake. <laughs> Flying over continent, we know how to do. Uh, we crossed the US two years ago. Uh, now the question is how we fly over the oceans. And uh, for example, uh, the flight from China to Hawaii, which is the first time we'll be over the oceans, will last about five days, five nights, or at least five days, five nights. So when you leave the coast of China, you have a weather forecast for the other side, which is six days in advance. And we all know that six days in advance or six day weather forecasts are not real, reliable at all. Uh, so the weather will change and uh, the flight path will have to change and, ad and be adapted. And that's the role of the control center in Monaco. During the day it flies, the electricity coming from the sun runs the four electrical motors and load the batteries. So during the night, we use the batteries to reach the next sunrise, continue the flight the next day, the next night, the next day, and so on, theoretically forever. Only the pilot is the limit. We'll uh, also learn a lot about ourselves because we will be tired, uh, we'll be maybe exhausted, we'll try to avoid it. But this is also an exploration about how we do and how we are and who we are. So uh, next to uh, a, a, a mission, next to a technical challenge, that's also a human challenge. Our mission, our goal, is to raise the popular support, is to have enough million people inspired by clean technologies who can tell to the government, yes, we support this, go for it. The number of Ebola cases in the worst affected countries in West Africa has continued to decline, but this hasn't stopped efforts to develop vaccines and new ways of detecting the virus. One 15-minute test has been approved by the World Health Organization. Another is on track to be accepted. In the fight against Ebola, time plays a crucial role. The longer it takes to detect the virus, the more likely it will spread and kill. It currently takes between 12 and 24 hours to find out if someone is infected with the virus. There is no vaccine or treatment against Ebola, so detecting the virus and isolating the patient as early as possible is key to controlling the epidemic. With a mobile kit, we can test directly in the community and minimize patients' exposure to the virus in medical facilities, because that continues to be where the virus propagates. The solar-powered diagnostic unit works in 15 minutes. It's essentially a lab in a suitcase and can be deployed anywhere as it doesn't need electricity. The kit can detect 30 pathogens using DNA fragments to identify them. Dr. Ahmed Abdel Rahid is the new test's main inventor. Normally, the people are using two kinds of tests. The, the, the rabbit test, which is like the pregnancy test, and this test is um, it's very rapid, 15 minutes. But the problem is that this test, it's not uh, good in the specificity. And this is a big problem if you send body home, which has an Ebola, 
and he, he, you, you declare it as has no Ebola. This is the big problem of the first test. Second test is very sensitive, very good, but you need a big lab, you need big machine, and you need also minus 20 freezers and all these stuff, which is difficult to find in a, in a rural area in Africa. In the test we are working on, it's, it's very simple if you use it. You just take the virus, Put, put a buffer to inactivate it and destroy the, the, the outer membrane and release the genome. And then you take the genome, you take five microliter from this, put it in a, in a tube which contain all the Asian you need, and that's it, finished. We'd love to hear from you if you have any suggestions of science or technology stories we should be covering on Al Jazeera. You can get in touch on Twitter at Tarek Basley or make a comment on this post. Still to come this week, Pakistan scrambled to register more than 100 million SIM cards. We'll tell you why. And lifted out of poverty, the amazing story of one Indian village. Now though, some of the other top technology stories of the week. Doctors at the Medical University of Vienna have fitted three men with bionic hands that are able to be controlled by the mind. You may have seen our piece in last week's show about robotic limb replacements. Well, these prosthetics take the technology a step further. The men can carry out everyday activities such as pouring liquid, lifting objects and undoing buttons, all controlled by nerves and muscles transplanted into their arms from their legs. The price, around $35,000. The New Zealand company behind this jetpack has floated on the stock market. Shares in the Martin Aircraft Company rose 50% before dropping back. The company says it wants to use the new investment to further develop the aircraft. These jetpacks are designed to carry people or objects up to 1,000 metres in the air at speeds of around 75 kilometres an hour. The first model, designed for emergency services, will go on sale next year and costs about 200,000 US dollars. Okay, so do you want to tell a story? Uh, sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now, it's, now everything is popping into my brain. Okay. This week, online video sharing site YouTube launched a special version of its app aimed at children. It will offer many episodes of children's shows and is designed to be child friendly with large colorful icons and minimal scrolling. It also includes a timer to limit use. So, is it what parents need to protect their children from adult content online, or will it provide YouTube with a captive market for advertising? Eyeballs are shifting to mobile and digital. Nobody's really watching uh, TV as much, they're cord cutting. So by building an audience early on, uh, they're gonna have that into, an adult, into adulthood so they can continue to advertise to them. I actually applaud this initiative and have been able to see what type of content and what type of setting will be provided. And I think that it is really important to have a curated space where there are videos which are suitable for children, but I think there is a whole lot more that is needed to go with this. Is it even possible for Google to create a safe space given their business? which is to spy on people, to track them, and to try and learn as much about them as possible because that's what they sell to their real customers. So is a company that does this even capable of creating a safe space for children or for anyone else for that matter? Well, we've seen the Oscars this week come and go as they do every year with glamour, glitz and plenty of nonsense on the red carpet. But one issue that's not nearly so trivial and has become a headache for the movie industry is video streaming. It's seen by some as a threat, to others it's an opportunity. You could say it was Napster that started it all. Free file downloads, remember them, the music industry hated it. But downloading seems so 10 years ago. Streaming is apparently the future, yet for film at least, that seems to be giving Hollywood a bit of a headache. Here's why. There are loads of legal streaming sites out there. You pay your monthly fee, you watch as much as you like, job done, perfect. But there are lots of illegal sites out there too. They stream pirated movies, people can watch them at no cost. Now those sites are breaking the law, but as for those people who sit at home, they stream, they watch these films, are they acting illegally? That's kind of a tricky subject. You speak to one lawyer and they'll tell you one thing. It's not illegal to actually view a movie that streams on your computer. As long as the, uh, the copy that streams does not make a duplicate on the computer, 
it is not violating one of the exclusive rights that the copyright owner holds. You speak to another and they'll tell you something else. In fact, you are still copying to a server, even temporarily, the material. It is copyright infringement to stream material that you don't have a license for, or that you don't own, or you pay, you're not paying for in some fashion. Okay, how about a third opinion? You can think of copyright law as a list of things you're not allowed to do. Uploading a movie is on that list. That's making a second copy. That's generally going to be illegal. But streaming a movie just to watch it, being a viewer, that's not really something that's on the list of things that copyright law forbids. The industry is going after a lot of these sites, but the problem it has is many are based in countries where the U.S. court, quite simply, has no legal jurisdiction. It's the independent films you could say really feel hit hard, like this one, 20 feet below, financed by individuals. The streamers have been enjoying this, but they've not been paying for it. Yet its maker is unhappy, but also optimistic. It can be frustrating because I get these Google alerts that come in every day showing me where, it, where it's being streamed. And to, you know, each one of those represents uh, a financial loss to us, in theory, if those people would have otherwise bought it. But on the, the flip side, it's technology that's often allowed us to make movies like this or, or improve the way we make the movies uh, and distribute them. So it's a bit bittersweet, really. One source told me that the studios are unlikely to go after individuals too often because they worried the court case could go against them. It's likely the industry will be forced to adapt if it wants to beat the pirates. When it comes to wealth and to access to technology, the world is still characterized by inequalities, the have and the have not. But sometimes one person can change that. Take a look at this story from a small village in India where a remarkable transformation has taken place over the last eight years. At first glance, it looks like any other village in India. But that changes if you look and listen closely. Kuldeep Chauhan is an engineer responsible for the high-tech amenities in Punsuri village, including 24 security cameras and free public Wi-Fi. Growing up in this village, Chauhan remembers wading through mud to get to school. Today, it's very different. 100% we have paved roads, sewage and water supply, as well as high-tech amenities and even apps so parents can watch their kids' activities in school. The changes here are focused on helping people. The free public Wi-Fi has been popular with villagers who surf the web and can now get work done with a few taps of the screen. Wi-Fi has made a real difference. I don't have to travel all the way to the city to fill out government forms. I can do that sitting here. The process has been strategic, starting with building proper roads, then this water purification plant, which sells 20 liters of water for six cents, and a public address system, which informs people of local news and public announcements. Aside from high-tech investments such as free public Wi-Fi and CCTV cameras, this mobile library helps people here educate themselves. Villagers say it's the utilization of existing government funding and the foresight to use it, which separates this village from most others in the country. And that contrast is clear in the nearby village of Verjot, where the roads are crumbling and there's little sanitation, let alone things such as Wi-Fi or public cameras. This sub-district official says other villages in the area are slowly learning from Punsuri's example. He credits the village's forward thinking to its leaders. The villages nearby are headed by older men who aren't as aware or motivated to learn about government programs. These guys, they're young, active, willing to take advice. No wonder they've progressed. The next step for Punsuri is to continue its development with plans to improve the look of the village and build public parks, demonstrating the journey of one village as it blends the traditional with the modern. The deadline has passed in Pakistan for its mobile phone operators to verify more than 100 million prepaid SIM cards. The government launched the biometric verification scheme after a Taliban attack on a school in Peshawar killed 145 people in December. Over 70 countries around the world have made the registration of prepaid users mandatory. Countries like Afghanistan and China are considering the same steps. Nations including Canada, the Czech Republic, New Zealand, Romania and the UK have rejected the measure. 
In its most recent report, the Association of Mobile Operators says there's no evidence that a lack of a SIM card registration increases the risk of criminal or terrorist activities. Under the government's new action plan, the Ministry of Interior has made it mandatory that all phone providers within Pakistan will have to re-verify the SIMs that are issued to its customers. People who have numbers right now in Pakistan will have to go show their identity papers. You can see people queuing across Pakistan at the telephone company offices in order to ensure that their phones are not blocked. After the deadline, any unverified SIM will be automatically blocked. The people will have to bring their national identity card. They have to go through a biometric process. Now, the government says that it is doing this in order to ensure that these SIMs are not used in heinous crimes and acts of terror. In the past, many of the bomb blasts that have taken place in Pakistan have taken place through mobile telephones. The government now wants to ensure that there are no loopholes left there. But importantly, it has to deal with 103 million SIMs, a Herculean task by any stretch of the imagination. Robots come in all shapes and sizes, and the one you're about to meet is a little more human than most. Roboy was developed at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the University of Zurich. Recently, I had the chance to meet Roboy and speak to Dr. Rolf Pfeiffer, one of its creators. He explained what makes Roboy so different. Most robots, with very few exceptions, have motors in the joints, but obviously humans don't have motors in the joints, and we wanted to mimic the musculoskeletal system. So this is what we call a tendon-driven robot. It actually has muscles that you can see here with the springs. And here you can see the tendons that drive the shoulder joint. So you were using nature as your guide? Absolutely. We have, for the last 20 years, we have been building biologically inspired robots. And I think we can, we can actually learn a lot from nature. It doesn't mean that we have to stick to what nature has done, you know, we are engineers, we can use other things, we can use other materials, but I think it's a great source of inspiration. So tendons and muscles have been the basis of this creation. Absolutely. Uh, show me a little bit in more detail how, how that transpires, how it works. Okay, if you perform a movement like that, then many muscles have to be coordinated and actuated to varying extents. Right? Of course, we've learned that, so for us, this is completely effortless. But in this robot, which, so there are nine muscles controlling the shoulder joint. Which muscle, or which muscles, do I have to actuate how much to achieve a particular movement? We can no longer program that. I mean, it would be silly to say this muscle, this much, this muscle, this much. So we need a learning mechanism. And so we basically demonstrate the movement to the robot, and then the, move, the robot can replicate. And that's where artificial intelligence steps into a project like this. Exactly. So that's really, I think this is artificial intelligence at its best. Well, that's all I have for you this week. I hope you'll share this video and take a look at the Al Jazeera English website, aljazeera.com. You'll find all our previous shows there. You can also follow me, Tarek Basley, on Twitter, at Tarek Basley. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.